is coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Cause our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates, make way before the The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? And our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. And our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No. Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. And our God is a Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb.
I'm calling on the God of Mary Whose favor rests upon the lowly I know with you all things are possible I'm calling on the God of David Who made a shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Yeah. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Yeah, oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your
changes us, it changes what we see and what we see.
could I say about him? My God is But we are continuing our series today on uh, 1 Thessalonians. You say, we've been in the, the chapter 5 for what seems like three or four weeks now. And it just, man, it just seems like uh, we've just continued on and continued on. And uh, last week we had several real short verses. And uh, this week we have several real short verses. So we'll see how it goes, see how long it goes. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 is where we're going to be looking at in just a moment. But... Um, We're talking about standing firm today, and we're talking about standing firm in the Spirit. And uh, this got me thinking about NASCAR. How many of you are NASCAR fans out there? Anybody in here, okay, would be willing to say they're NASCAR fans? Um, I want you to think about a NASCAR driver, okay? You got that person pictured in your mind, and maybe you have somebody in your mind, and even if you don't like the sport of NASCAR, uh, you think it's driving in meaningless circles or whatever, just picture somebody that is absorbed in winning a race. Think about the adrenaline charge as the race begins. Gentlemen, start your what? Engines. Start your engines and the adrenaline that goes on with that and how exciting that is. And all of a sudden, in his ear, he can hear the crew pit, and he can hear the crew chief as he says, pedal to the metal, right? Full out, through all the turns, never throttle down, throw all caution to the wind. You think, well, that's not a good crew chief, is it, right? That's one way, okay? Uh, But then you have another one that's like, hey, listen, safety is the key. That is an expensive car. Be careful with that car. Take care of that car. Uh, Stay a few lengths back of all the drivers. Stay back a little bit, okay? we got to protect that car. Avoid any chance of a crash whatsoever. You think, well, that's not a good crew chief either, is it? There is not much of a chance of winning a race when you do either of those. Pedal to the metal or safety is the key. See, the driver uses his skill and all of his resources within his car to navigate the track with both objectives of speed, but also safety in mind. Now, the Christian life is all about balance. And let's take this illustration and really apply it to us spiritually. You have a few kinds of different Christians that can come up. One, I would like to write down, if you're taking notes, a free-spirited Christian. Some people live their lives with a free spirit. Anything goes whatsoever, this type of mentality that anything goes, they don't have a critical bone in their body. They're driven by emotions. Uh, They live a lifestyle of impulsivity, right? They can make life very interesting, but also very dangerous when their passion has no boundaries. They're like that NASCAR driver that's pedal to the metal, uh, you know, full throttle, just going in, just taking the most dangerous turns at full speed. And there are many churches who have grown out of this emotional and experience-oriented approach to spirituality. So that's one type. But then you also have the other side, which is the rule-driven. While some people want to see life completely controlled by rules and regulations and guidelines, everything must be controlled, and they do not tolerate surprises. Don't do that. That will throw them for a loop. Everything must function in their life like clockwork. Change is an abomination, right? Don't change anything, and they can be very predictable. They must have everything proven to them before they can take any steps forward. They would be the ones that are driving very slowly and avoiding the crashes in the NASCAR race. I had written down driving like a grandma, but have you seen some grandmas drive? I wouldn't count that anymore, right? These people are driving very slowly, though. They're in their lifestyle. They're very slow, and You know what Paul speaks? He speaks against both of these. He says, don't be an extreme. Don't be like one of these extremes. He speaks against overly restricting the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Don't restrict the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but he also speaks about being careless and not discerning truth from error. Let's read our passage real quick, and we'll jump into this this morning. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 19. It says, quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophecies. Prove how many things? All things. 
hold fast that which is good. And it says abstain from, what's that word again? All appearances of evil. Let's pray. Dear Lord, God, as we sang to you this morning, we sang these words and we asked you to bring your spirit upon this place. It was perfect. We're going right along with the sermon that we're speaking today, Lord, and the passage that we're looking at here, we're asking you to move in this place. We're asking you to come down upon this place, Lord, and come down upon each person in here and move within their lives today. As your word is read and as I speak these words that you've given to me, I pray that you would open our hearts to hear them and that there would be change that would happen. That there would be movement in our lives, that we would not be uh, the same stale person, the same stale Christian we were before, but we would want to move forward and do something for you. And as Paul is writing to these people here in 1 Thessalonians, as he's writing to these people and he's telling them these things, these things that are holding them back from truly living a Christian life that you want us to live, I pray that we would take those words and even hear it today in this century right now, even today in this moment, even in this week here, that we would take these words and say, I don't want to do these things that Paul is saying here. I want to move forward in my Christian life. So God, I pray that you would help each and every one of us, that we would hear your word, that it would speak to us, that we would open up our hearts and you would do something in a wonderful way today, Lord. So excited about being here today, so excited about what we just sang, the music that we just sang to you, and just so excited to hear what you have for us in your word today. So it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The instructions in our passage today, they go together. And they help us to understand how the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. But the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the things that we're to do with with this information. So the first thing that we see here, number one, we're going through our verses here. It's an automatic outline right away. We're going to see this, and you can write this down and have your outline already. There's several things here that we see. Number one is quench not. Quench not. And specifically here in verse 19, it says quench not the Spirit. The way the Spirit works in our lives is related to fire. Um, How many of you out there would be honest and say I'm a little bit of a pyromaniac in here? Anybody in here? I see several hands, okay? I would agree with you. And we understand fire analogies, all right? When there's a relationship going on and you've had this relationship that's happening and you're in a dating relationship and all of a sudden things start to seem to not be going so well, what is the terminology that we use? The spark is not there anymore. It's fizzling out. It's not there the way that it was. The fire has gone out. And we use those terminologies. They, they make sense to us. And so him using this in the Bible, it makes sense to us in life. You know, somebody cut me off and I got fired up, right? I got emotional. I got upset. I got fired up. Or I was burning up with anger. I was upset and irritated and aggravated and all this. The fire analogy is there. Or somebody, we have a couple of pro cornholers in here, and I'll hear this every now and then from them, I was on fire the other day, right? I was on fire. I was just throwing them in and throwing them in, and I couldn't miss the board. Uh, I've heard that several times, fire. There's an analogy there that's being used. And we understand what fire does. It, It does what? It burns. And I love that Paul describes the work of the Holy Spirit in this way. It is a fire. It's a burning. It's something that's happening. There's movement and there's motion going on. When a Christian is on fire for the Lord, there are things that are happening in their life. The Spirit is convicting them of sin. When they're close to God and they're on fire with God, the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is convicting them. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. Or you should be doing this. It's convicting The Spirit is filling them with enthusiasm. You never will say this about a person that is on fire for the Lord. That person's on fire for the Lord, and they're just like. Right? That's not the way we are. When we're on fire for the Lord, we're excited. We're ready to do something, right? There's enthusiasm there. So the Spirit of the Lord is filling them with enthusiasm. The Spirit is motivating them to action. You also will not say somebody is on fire from the Lord when they are literally doing this at all times. Just sitting, not doing anything, not moving, not doing anything for the Lord, not moving in a church, not doing anything. No, there's a movement that's happening. There's an action that's going on because they're on fire for the Lord. Look at where they're going and what they're doing and these things. 
And the Spirit is leading them in the paths of righteousness, the paths of, of right living, doing what is right. They're on fire for the Lord. Look at the way they're living their life. And there's an incredible opportunity for a Christian who is on fire for God. The problem is, and why this verse is here, is that many will quench that fire of the Holy Spirit. We put it out. Think about putting out a fire. I literally wanted to bring a fire in here. How cool would that have been? Again, the pyro in me. I wanted to have a little flame going on here and a big fire extinguisher. Watch this. I feared for my job and my life, though, and for you guys as well. Uh, We'd all walk out of here smelling like charcoal. Uh, But putting out a fire, just think about how you put out a fire. A fire extinguisher. Or if you get fire on you, you've been taught since you were a kid to stop, drop, and roll. But how do we put the fire out when it comes to our spiritual life? The way we can quench that fire, the way we can push the Holy Spirit out. And there are several ways here that I've written down that we can quench the Holy Spirit. One of those things is we quench the Spirit when we allow things to control us. Things such as substances and in alcohol, it says in Ephesians 5.18, it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now this is a debatable thing, and I know amongst Christians, people have all kinds of ideas. And I've, had, I've heard good from both sides. Ah, you shouldn't touch it. Hey, a little bit here and there is okay. I've heard all that stuff, and I'm not here to debate that. That is not what I'm here for. When I'm standing here behind the pulpit, God has ordained me to speak from His Word and His Word only. So I'll tell you what God's Word says here, and leave my opinion out. It says here, and be not drunk with wine. The Apostle Paul, he wrote this. I can tell you plainly that to be drunk would be a sin. Proverbs says this, Proverbs 20 and verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So here's the question that comes up. How can you be filled with the Spirit when you're filled with a substance. And I'm not only talking about alcohol, I'm talking about anything that fills you and takes your mind away and and takes your mind to where it shouldn't be. Being drunk does nothing but causes problems in your life. I wonder how many could say, I remember getting drunk and it helped my life tremendously. My life got all back together because of being drunk or, or my wife came back to me because of being drunk. No, those things don't happen. The truth is that every mention of drunkenness in the Bible is followed by sin, Pain, suffering, and brokenness. How can we be drunk on a Friday and Saturday and then want to come in and serve God with our whole heart? The point is not the alcohol. The point is the thing that is controlling you, the thing that is overwhelming you. He says, don't be drunk with wine. Why? Because it fills you and therefore you are not filled with the Spirit. You're not making wise decisions. So we quench the Spirit when we allow things, substances, and things to control us. We don't make wise decisions. But number two, we quench the Spirit with living in the Spirit of this world. Ephesians 2.2 says this, and you can see it up on the screen above me. We're in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. Time past, before you were saved, according to the prince of the power of the air, the Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says this, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Living worldly, living by the belief system and the things of the world will quench the spirit very, very quickly. You say, I don't get it. I'm trying to live for the Lord, but I'm doing these things and I have one foot in the world and and one foot in church and I'm trying to live for God, but things aren't working out for me. Well, that's why. You're quenching the spirit. You're trying to live like the world. You're making decisions according to the ways of the world. Don't be absorbed with the world's affections. That's one way to quench the spirit. Why am I not on fire for the Lord? Because I'm living like the world. Another way is we quench the Spirit by living in sexual sin. This is something that Paul has already talked about in 1 Thessalonians, but in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says, What? I love how he says that, right? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Paul says this after just hammering down on the way these people were living in a sexual way. In verse 18, look at this, it says, Flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth doeth without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Why am I not on fire for God? Why is the spirit quenched? Maybe I'm living in a sexual way. Maybe I'm looking at sites that I'm not supposed to. Maybe I'm flirting a little bit too much at at church. Uh, Maybe 
maybe, or no, church, <laughs> at work, <laughs> please don't be flirting in church. That was a slip. That got you awake. All right. We're going to be watching you, right? Maybe flirting a little bit too much at work, you know. Uh, these sexual sins, they come up, and you know what it does? It, it quenches your spirit. It quenches the Holy Spirit. Number three, we quench the spirit by doubting the power of the spirit. We say we're saved, and we say we're Christians, and I believe God can do all things, but not that. But not this. But I'm too far for this. The Bible says here, in Galatians 3, 3, are ye so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? We say we believe God and yet we turn back to other things and, and try to do things on our, on our own way and we don't have a belief that God can do something powerful in your life and we doubt the power of the spirit. And lastly, we quench the spirit by disobeying the power of the spirit. And I think for most Christians, this is the one that will get almost all of us. We disobey his leading. We hear him. And I, many of us remember when we were first saved and God's speaking to us, go do this, go do that, go speak to that person, go do these things. And, you know, as time goes on and as we become more Christianized, we stop doing those things. The Holy Spirit is working in our lives, but many times we resist him. John 14, 16 says this through 18, it says, And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And listen to this. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. You see, Jesus Christ, he gave us the Holy Spirit to minister to us in our lives and work through us. But when we push him away and we, we ignore him and we deny him, guess what? We are quenching his spirit. How often do we resist him and push him away? Say, I want to be used of God, but I keep quenching and quenching. What about when the spirit tells us to confess a sin? He brings it to our minds. He says, hey, this is wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. And you kind of push past it. You ignore it. You say, oh, it's not that bad. We don't confess the sin. Maybe he's telling us to talk to that person. You know somebody's in need. Maybe reach out to that brother or sister that is hurting. Maybe share a testimony. Maybe raise your hand in worship. We're going to get real today. Maybe God is saying, you should be raising your hand today. You should be worshiping me. And we resist him because I'm afraid of what other people will say or how they'll look at me. Maybe God's telling you to go to the altar. And we resist it. And over time, we keep resisting and resisting and resisting and we're quenching. Maybe he's asking you to ask that person out to lunch. Maybe he's asking you to pray with that waiter that's there at your table. And on and on and on. These are the things that the Holy Spirit is speaking into our lives. And yet we quench and we push away and we say, not this time, not this time, not this time. And we keep pushing him away. I can tell you this for a matter of fact. <clears throat> God wants to do something with every one of your lives. Every single one of you in here today. I don't care of your age. I don't care how old or how young you are. God wants to do something in your life, but it's you that's holding you back. Allow God to be used through you. So to quench is to ignore the Spirit's prompting. When Paul, what Paul is saying here is, give in to the Spirit's leading. When the Spirit prompts you to show love to someone, do it and do not hold back. He say, you know what, Paul, he's trying to tell these people, hey, I have a better way. As we talked about last week, I have a better way. I have a way for you to live and to prosper in your Christian life, but you've got to stop quenching the spirit, number one. Number two, the second thing we see here is quench not, and the second thing is despise not. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 20. <clears throat> he says, despise not prophecies. This is an interesting encouragement from God through Paul here. Prophesying is very interesting. Unfortunately, because of certain cultic tendencies in our day, we think of prophesying as some special power to predict the future. And so when he says to not despise it, you're like, well, I'm not despising that. But prophesying is the gift of proclaiming the gospel. In an easy to understand term, this is God's voice being spoken through someone or something to us. One great preacher said this, prophesying is declaring the mind of God in the power of the Spirit. We are not to despise this. To despise is to feel a deep contempt 
or a disgust for something, to hate that thing. And specifically here, we're talking about God's word and God's teaching. In Bible times before the New Testament was written, people spoke the words of God audibly. So prophesying really becomes what we call today this expository preaching or or teaching here. It is sharing the mind of God through the word of God. And Paul says, do not despise this. What Paul is saying here is don't despise God's written word. How many of us have a despised uh, mentality when it comes to God's word? Well, that's ancient, that's old. I really don't want to read it. I don't want to think about it. It tells me things that I don't want to hear and we despise God's word. It says don't despise God's preached word. Don't despise God's personal word to you. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 says this, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men. Listen to these three ways that he speaks unto men. This prophesying, it comes in three ways. One, edification. Two, exhortation. And three, comfort. These are the ways that prophesying works in your life. It edifies you. It lifts you up. It exhorts you. It comforts you. So hearing the voice of God, it should do some things. It should change how we act. It should change how we think. It should change how we live our life. And we're hearing that even from the song that we sang today, the Spirit, it changes everything when it comes in. Don't treat it lightly. If you would listen and hear to God's voice, then doing so would save you from many, many heartaches and many headaches. So why do we despise something that is trying to help? Even Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, we read this uh, very early on. In, in chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. He's talking about when he first came to the Thessalonians here, and he was preaching the gospel, it came in power, and it came with the Holy Ghost, and he was preaching to them there, and there was a change of heart. The Holy Spirit was moving and convicting and, and convicting them of their sins and changing through their word and through God's word. You see, their eyes were opened as they saw a need for Christ and Christ alone. The Holy Spirit enlightened them with his word. Look at verse 6 now says, and ye became followers of us. And why are they following them? Because they follow the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. You know what we're not to do? We're not to quench the spirit. But we're also not to despise God's word when it's being spoken. When we hear it, we don't despise it. We don't hate it. We don't want, not want to listen to it. No, we listen to it. We open our hearts to hear what God has to speak through our Bible reading, through the preaching of his word. And then lastly, number three, we prove and hold. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, let's break this up into some pieces here. First of all, let's read the first part of that. It says in verse 21, prove all things. God wants us to prove all things. This means that we are to test examine, interpret, and discern everything that we come across. For a moment, let's not talk about the things of the world, because that's easy for most of us. We see, oh, that's sin, that's sin. Let's call it sin. That's wrong, that's wrong. That's not what I'm talking about for just a moment here. Those are things that will try to trip us up and pull us away, but let's talk about those people and those things that proclaim to be speaking on God's behalf. Now more than ever, if you want to hear a sermon or a word from God, then you literally can go on Instagram. You can go on any website, any Facebook. Uh, you can go to YouTube, and you can hear full sermons from people all around the country, and you can hear somebody that's speaking, and it's pretty, it's an amazing thing on one side, but it's on the other side, you got to be careful. How many remember having to get CDs before to listen to anything, okay? How many before that, you remember tapes, do the kids even know? Do you guys know what tapes are? Cassette tapes? You do? You're, you're with it, right? It's probably coming back. Cassette tapes are going to come back, like with bell bottoms and all the other stuff, right? Cassette tapes are coming back. Uh, what about eight, eight something? What are those things called? I see some eight, eight tracks. Yeah. Uh, that's what we had to do before. If we wanted to listen to something, whether it's music or even preaching, I remember having preaching tapes that we would get and the, the uh, evangelist would come through and he'd sell you his tapes and you'd get them and you'd listen to the same sermon he just preached, right? Uh, and you'd hear that all over again. But now more than ever, we have to be on guard with everything. I mean, I'm telling you with everything because everything is at our fingertips. We have to be on guard for what we take as truth from God. 
I know many are intrigued by, you know, when they see a video and there's a fancy stage or there's nice lights and big colorful screens or maybe even the way the pastor is dressed or some of the object lessons that he has and maybe even that he has thousands of followers. This guy must be good. Look at the screen behind him. This guy must be good. He's wearing Jordans. This guy must be good. Look at what he's doing and look at all his followers. And I'm not saying all that's wrong. Don't misinterpret me here. But what I'm saying is don't be enamored by the visuals that you don't prove what he is saying is true. There are many preachers out there who are preaching false doctrines and false interpretations. During COVID, there was a particular pastor, and you can look him up if you want to. Uh, be, he became well-known because his church poured hundreds of thousands of dollars into his production of his online sermons. And I'm not just talking about getting it out there. I'm talking about his stage was completely awesome. At one point during COVID, because obviously he couldn't meet, so he had just video going, uh, they filled his entire stage with water. I don't know how they did it, but it was pretty cool looking, but they filled the entire thing with water. So it was a big pond, and it was a huge stage. It was like a big old pond on the stage, and they put a boat in the middle of it, and it got people talking. They wanted to know, what is this all about? And he literally got out there, took off his socks and shoes, and walked through the water, and he got in the boat, and it was really, really neat, and it was awesome. It caught my attention. I'm like, what's he saying? I want to know what's going on here. But the thing is, he was gathering a following because of all the things in the production that he was showing. But when you dove into it and you proved, this is what I found out, this man does not believe in the Trinity. He does not believe in the Trinity in the way that he's supposed to. And he preaches a gospel that is a prosperity gospel. Where if you only trust in Jesus, you'll have health and wealth and success. And you say, oh, that's not true. If you don't believe me, I can take you to his website where it literally says that on his website if you only follow then these things will happen for you and I can promise you even though you know you, you some might say oh he's just being critical and why is he doing this you know what it's important for us to prove and this is from God's word we're not being critical we're not judging but we're proving what God's word says versus what man says and you know what the devil likes to do he likes to distract he likes to bring big flashy things so that we see a lot and we don't hear a lot but this comes straight from Scripture. Look at Romans chapter 16, verse 17. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Listen to this. This is important. Mark that person that causes divisions and offenses. What's that next word? Contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. And what's the next two words? Avoid them. Oh, man, Paul. Wow. Wow. You are a critical person. You are judgmental. How dare you say that about those people? No, Paul is trying to help us to understand this. Look at the next verse. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Yikes. Yikes. This is some tough words here, right? If I was to say this today, I'd be getting some calls and phone calls and get some hate mail here. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. But what are they serving? Their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Here I am telling you as the pastor of Mounts Run, be careful. The snippets you see on Instagram, the, the messages that you see, the flashy things that you see, be aware because the devil will use those things to deceive you. John gives us a test to take when someone claims to be speaking on God's behalf. Look at 1 John 4 verses 1 through 3. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. But, what's this next word? Try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out in the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit, if it's the Spirit of God, listen to this. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And that is the spirit of the Antichrist, the anti-God, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now already it's in the world. You say, oh, the Antichrist is not coming later. Uh, he's here. The Antichrist is here. He is trying to deceive and decept people away from God. So two tests here real quick. Number one, is it promoting Jesus Christ? The preacher that you're listening to, the person that's talking to you, the thing that you're reading, is it promoting Jesus Christ? Is it confessing Jesus Christ? To confess that he has come in full flesh and is all about the Lord. Is Jesus exalted through this person or this thing? 
And number two, look at this next part of this passage, 1 John 4, 4 through 6. He says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, these false teachers. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. How awesome would that be? Say, Mounts Run, we are of God. I'm a Christian. I am of God. And listen to what he says here. He says, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So number one, is it promoting Jesus Christ? But number two, is it aligned with the scripture? And what he's saying here is God gave us these words. Back then, we did not have the Bible. We didn't have the scripture. We didn't have the New Testament. So what they were speaking was straight from God. And he says, if it's of us, it's of God. Now that we have God's holy word, we take God's word and we say, is it of God? I look to the Bible and I say, does it say that in the Bible? You see, how do we know if it's of the spirit of God? Three things when it doesn't contradict the scripture. Say the things that I believe, it goes against the Bible. Then you're wrong. We don't like to say that in this modern century, right? You're wrong. If it contradicts the word, uh, the word of God, it's wrong. When it doesn't add on to the scripture or remove away from the scripture, you see, that's how we know that it's of God. And so the Bible literally tells us, prove all things. Every single thing should be taken through a filter, and that filter is God's holy word. Is it taken away from God? Is it contradicting God? Is it adding to God? Then it is wrong. The Bible literally says to prove these things. Now, going back to our text real quick, I know we're going long. I'm about to be done. It says in the second part of verse 21 and then verse 22, he says, hold fast that which is good, In verse 22, a famous verse that many use for many different reasons, abstain from all appearance of evil. We literally just heard this verse on Wednesday night, but said a different way in Romans 12, verse 9, it says, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. We're told to hold fast or cleave to that which is good and to abhor or abstain from all appearances of evil. Abstain is not to play around with, It's not to think that it's not going to impact me. It's to stay away from all appearances of evil. And where do I find what evil is? It's in God's book. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain that which is evil. All appearances of evil. We're not to play around with it. You see, Christians have this this mindset that I can be a little bit like the world and I can put one foot in the world but yet still follow Christ. And Paul is saying here, don't quench the spirit. Don't do those things. You're not living for God when you're living like the world, when you're acting like the world, when you're trying to play around with these things that are evil things instead of abstaining from all appearances of evil, I want to play with it. I'm from Florida, and I don't know how many of you have been down to Florida and you've visited certain places, and you know what? We have a lot of gators down in Florida, okay? And you maybe have seen videos, Sports Center shared videos and things like that, but these gators that are down there, you do not mess with those things, right? Uh, there are some people that I see, they're golfing, all of a sudden the gator walks across, and you know what? There are some people that are like, I'm out, you know, I'm backing up. You can have that ball, I'll take a triple bogey on this one, you can have the ball, I'm done, Right? Then you'll see some that'll come up and want to mess with it. And I've seen videos like that, and it's scary what they do. They come up and slap it on the back and run away or something. Gators are not something you mess with, okay? Um, They are a scary thing. It's freaky how fast they are with those little legs, right? I don't know how they do it, but they're fast. I liken that to sin here is that sometimes we say, "I, I can mess with this thing. It's got little legs. It's a big thing, but I can get around to the tail and I can mess with this little sin and I can do this little sin. I can dabble in this sin. And you know what a gator does and loves to do is loves to turn around and snap with those big old teeth and take you under the water and spin you around. And that is what sin does. It takes us and it destroys and it gets us before we even realize it. You know what Paul says here? Abstain from all appearances of evil. You know what I want to be like? There's a gator. That's sin. That's wrong. I'm backing up. I'm getting away. I'm not even going to mess with it. And so here Paul is again. His heart, and this is my heart, man. This I didn't realize how tough 1 Thessalonians was going to be as all the things that we preach through and all the things that we've learned so far. But Paul, what I see here is a heart for somebody where he would get down on his hands and knees and he would beg, please, 
If you want to be the Christian that God wants you to be, do these things. Don't allow these things in your life. I see a better way. And there's so many people, even today, that we look around and we see these Christians that are dabbling in the world and they're going to get bit. It's going to be bad. There's going to be heartache and pain and stuff. And if only we could just say, hey, please don't do this. And I believe that's what Paul is doing here. Quench not the spirit. Prove those things. Hold fast to that which is good. Because I've never met anybody that hold fast to the good things of God. And held fast and stayed firm in their life. And things were super bad just because of them holding fast to God's word. Here Paul says to hold fast. That which is good and abstain from all appearance of evil. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes. Once again, in just a few verses, with a few words in each of these verses, Paul has unpacked a ton of meaning and application. These commands, it concludes his exhortations. You say, oh, we're near the end now. This concludes where he is encouraging these people here at Thessalonica. He's promoting liberty in the spirit while saying, be careful in your discernment and obviously reject those things which are evil. So that's my prayer for you today. As everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to ask you, how's the spirit in your life? Do you allow him to work in your life? Or are you allowing him to move freely in your life? Or are you quenching him? Are you stopping him? Are you holding him back? And then are you discerning the things that are right? Are you proving those things that you hear? Or are you just taking whatever? Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Oh, that's a new thing, so I think I'll just follow after that. Or are you taking it and applying it to Scripture and saying, does this match up or does this contradict with Scripture? And lastly, are you abstaining from all appearances of evil or are you dabbling in it? Are you playing around with some evil? Are you playing around with some sin? And soon it's going to bite you and devour you and, and cause pain in your life. As Paul says here, do these things, and I promise you life will be much better. I'm not preaching prosperity and health and wealth and all that stuff, but having a lifestyle of living for God is much better than living for this world. Dear Lord, we love you and praise you, and thank you so much for this time together. <clears throat> God, I pray for every Christian in here that they would not quench the Spirit. They would allow you to work in their lives. They would notice where things are holding them back and where it's it's kind of uh, the devil is trying to trip them up and they would notice those things, they would prove those things and they would abstain from those things. That would help us more importantly and most importantly just to live for you. Put our whole heart into what you want us to do. God, I pray that you would use the words that I've said today that were from you, I pray, that were from your word and that it would change our lives and make a difference in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand? We're going to have a song. We also have a, a baptism. So after the song, we'll have the baptism and then some announcements after that. You give light, you are love. Thank you.
Will cry, these bones will sing. Great. 